it's lovely to see so many um, faces and names that I recognise. And I have to say, this is the most dressed up I have been in weeks. I've even put my dangly earrings on for you all um, because it's Christmas or we're nearly at Christmas. Um, and today I really want us to get into the festive mood because I suspect that even those of you who thought that you might come into London to come and see the lights, your plans have probably changed over the last, well, last few days. I think everybody's plans have changed. But I want to share the best of the festive season with you this afternoon. Um, some of you um, might know that I, well, I used to in pre-COVID days do real walks. And last Christmas, I did this walk, a similar walk to the one we're going to do today. Um, we're going a little bit further because it's virtual. Um, but last year, I, I had I'd taken goodies and things to eat. So if you have got any um, Christmas fare, um, do feel free to tuck in whilst we're going around. And I will be mentioning various bits of food and, and so on as, as we make our way around. So where are we going to go? Let's see, I'm going to share my screen and then hopefully we can get going. So um, we're starting, um, I'm going to tell you where we're going to go. We're starting in the north of, of the centre of London on the Marylebone Road. And over the next 45, 50 minutes, we're going to wend our way southwards. You'd be pleased to know it's all downhill. So no hills to climb. And we'll go down Regent Street. We'll make our way down Oxford Street. We'll eventually come south onto Regent Street again um, and onto Piccadilly. And then last but not least, make our way across to, I suppose, the most famous Christmas tree in London, um, in Trafalgar Square. So let's start here at, um, we're going to start outside the Marylebone Parish Church, close to Baker Street Underground. And certainly in the last few weeks, we've had the Advent services on the Sundays. And normally, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, we would be having services with the choir. And the choir is so good because so many of the singers come from the Royal Academy of Music, which is situated just across the road. I suspect this is going to be different this year. So we'll have to see. I don't know. Um, I haven't booked my place online yet um, for Christmas Eve, but um, I'm hoping there still might be some spaces. And when I think of Christmas, we think of carols, and we also think of Handel's Messiah, our adopted um, Englishman, um, or German who was adopted Englishman, George Frederick Handel, a resident of Westminster, and the Messiah, or, um, a real masterpiece, sung quite often, obviously, at Easter, but also sung at Christmas time. And this, uh, this is one of the um, choruses, you know, for unto us a child is born, one of my favourites. And if any of you have not had a chance to see a version of the Messiah this year, I want to recommend Messiah Reimagined. It was filmed in Handel's Church, St George's in Hanover Square, just south of Oxford Street, with an orchestra or a small ensemble, plus four soloists and, um, and then massed choirs, eight different choirs, each singing different anthems, pre-recorded on Zoom. It is a masterpiece. I'm slightly biased because it's, it was run by the London Handel Festival, of which I'm a trustee. It's on YouTube. It was on Facebook too, but it's now on, on YouTube. It really is a gem. So if you Google up Messiah Reimagined London Handel Festival, it should come up on YouTube and you can dip in and out of it. It's had thousands and thousands of views, but it is it just really gets you into the mood. So we move on now to a short distance, just a short distance away from the church. And I reckon that most of you will recognise this gentleman here, the great novelist, the great Victorian novelist, Charles Dickens. And this is a memorial or a, um, an engraving of the, on the sculpture on the wall of a building um, erected a relatively short time ago after the Second World War, because the house that he lived in um, has been rebuilt. But he lived in the area, he lived in Marylebone from 1839 to 1851. And during that time, he wrote six of his most famous novels, and they include um, things like David Copperfield here, down here. Um, one of my favourite characters is Lady with a Glass. I think somewhat gave midwifery a somewhat bad name, Mrs Gamp from Martin Chiselwood. But the one I want us to concentrate on is the one in the top left-hand corner. Here's a close-up, because this is, of course, A Christmas Carol and Ebenezer Scrooge. 
the beloved British author wrote A Christmas Carol in just six weeks in the run up to Christmas of 1843. And um, I think the publication date was the 19th of December. So just a few days ago was the anniversary. And it was an instant bestseller. It was the most successful book of the 1843 holiday period and by Christmas, so between the 19th of December and the 25th of December, it sold over 6,000 copies. I mean, incredible to think of even now, never mind then. And the usual arrangement was for authors to be paid a fee, but Dickens came up with a, an unusual arrangement with his publishers because he was very exacting about the quality of the publication. He wanted beautiful frontispieces, he wanted these hand tinted illustrations and this meant that the publisher said well okay as long as you pay for it. So with so many copies sold Dickens had anticipated quite a healthy profit but each copy was relatively expensive to produce so he didn't make that much money out of it initially although as we all know, went on to be reprinted and reprinted and still really a favourite today. And I was fortunate, I don't know if any of else of you were, um, in, the, in that little period of time when theatres reopened, I managed to go and see Simon Russell Beale starring as Ebenezer Scrooge, Ebenezer Scrooge in the Bridges production of A Christmas Carol. So hopefully that might be back on in the new year, who knows, let's, let's hope and fingers crossed. Um, 1843 was quite an important year because it's really around this time that a lot of our festivities, the traditions we have today, really came into being. Um, so I think he kick-started a yearly tradition um, and just a short distance from this memorial or this celebration of Charles Dickens, we have someone else who we really should remember at Christmas time. And it's here in the old Marylebone churchyard. Can you see, it says, here lie the remains of the Reverend Charles Wesley, who departed this life in 1788. Here's a picture of him. Born over 300 years ago, but still remembered today. Um, he was born, he's a younger brother, of the Methodist founder, John Wesley. Um, and, jo and Charles settled and worked in the area around the Marylebone Parish Church, having been born in Lincolnshire. Um, he's buried in the churchyard, as I say, and the memorial stone stands to him in this little memorial garden. It's said that he used to, he used to be seen riding along the high street, Marylebone High Street, in a blue smock on a small horse. And it's relevant at this time of year because he wrote the words to some, I think, I believe some six, over 600, um, um, sorry, 6,000 hymns and carols. And the one that really we remember this time of year where he wrote the words is Hark the Herald Angels Sing, which first appeared in 1739 in this collection of poems. And it's said that he was inspired by the sounds of London church bells while walking to church on Christmas day. And he wrote the Hark poem about a year after his conversion. Um, and it said, um, he wanted it read on Christmas Day, the opening line of Hark, how the welkin rings, how the heavens rings. Other hymns, he wrote, he wrote the words to other favourites of mine, Rejoice the Lord is King, um, Lo he comes with clouds of death descending, and Christ the Lord is risen today. Um, in the years that followed, there was a real revival of Christmas carols. So, you know, carols had flourished right through Tudor Elizabethan times with Henry VIII and his daughter Elizabeth I, but they became they came to an abrupt end, as we all know, um, during the Puritan period of the 17th century when Oliver Cromwell was Lord Protector. But there was a real revival during the period of Queen Victoria and her long reign. Um, and it was really in the middle of the 19th century that car carols such as O Come All You Faithful, O Little Town of Bethlehem, Once in Royal David's City, and Away in a Manger really flourished. So I think we're ready to start walking. And we're going to make our way, first of all, down Marylebone High Street, which has probably some of the most discreet lights, um, this lovely garlands, and you might see, you might be able to make out the M and the V, Marylebone Village. So let's make our way down the high street, looking quite quiet. And I want us to 
to make a detour one of many I think we'll be making this afternoon, but we'll see here where we've just left the Marrowbone Road and come past the church and the churchyard. We're making our way down the high street, but we're gonna just nip off to the side down Moxon Street. And then after that, come back onto the high street and then nip off down Marrowbone Lane for um, I think a few things to eat, in fact. So we're outside um, one of the best butchers, I think in London, the Ginger Pig. Um, now I'm not expecting you to have cooked a turkey or a goat or a, or a goose this afternoon. You might though want to indulge maybe in a in a sausage roll or a, a pigs in blanket. Um, I um, one of the things with the ginger pig is that they sell really really good not just um, turkeys but also really good hand raised pork pies. And for me and my family, that really is a tradition because I grew up having a slice of pork pie for my Christmas day breakfast. And I thought that's what all families did. Um, it was only as I grew up, I realized that that was quite an unusual thing to have for Christmas day morning, but it was our custom. And the reason it was our family custom was because my father and my grandfather were both church organists. And this meant on Christmas day, they were in and out having played for various services. And the only thing really you could have as a quick breakfast snack was a slice of, 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 as I say, of pork pie. But I, meant, I wanted to mention the ginger pig because um, of goose or geese and turkeys. Now, you might be having a turkey this year, but what was served for Christmas dinner or Christmas lunch in Victorian times? Well, during um, when Queen Victoria wrote in her diary, she um, wrote that they were having, well, I suppose not just a goose, but also um, mock turtle soup, um, several fish dishes, a number of roasts, including a baron of beef and a boar's head. So um, I think it was said that the queen often suffered from indigestion. But during the early part of her reign, it, it really was a goose that one would, would, would have indulged in. Certainly one was consumed by the Cratchits in A Christmas Carol. Local goose clubs were established early on in the year so that you could save up a few pennies each week um, to buy your bird. And even if you didn't have your own oven, which many households didn't, you could take your goose to the local baker to be cooked on Christmas morning. I like the fact that when, as turkeys began to become more popular, that the great journey to London started for turkeys, often back in October, when many of the, um, the these unsuspected birds who'd been reared in Norfolk um, to the east of London, what, some 80 miles away, um, had their feet clad in fashionable but hard-wearing leather to make their little visit, their little trip into the centre. And it said, they arrived often tired and, and obviously somewhat scrawny so that they could be then um, feasted and, and fattened up on London hospitality in the last few weeks before Christmas. So whether you're having a, a, a goose or a turkey or even beef this Christmas, um, maybe you'll buy it from the ginger pig. So next door to the ginger pig, we have the Fromagerie, a wonderful cheese shop and, and delicatessen. You can see it here. Um, with a rather convoluted one-way system this year to make sure we're, we're all socially distanced. And my idea of heaven really is their cheese room. We can see it here. And the queues I passed by earlier today, we may be in lockdown or in tier four in London, but that's not stopping people going and queuing for their cheese. And if we're having cheese, you may well be having some port. Um, this obviously hails from Portugal, and became popular in England in the 1700s when we were having one of our many wars or intrigues with France. I don't think we're quite at war with them at the moment, but we're, we're not. Um, we're obviously not not transporting goods between our two countries currently. And we fell in love with this um, drink. Um, this this is a bottle we have. I'd like to say a cellar. We don't really have a cellar. We just have a few bottles. But uh, I thought in um, in the worst of lockdown, we might have even cracked this open. But maybe this Christmas we will get get to drink it. Now, if you're going to have port, I hope that you've already got your Stilton cheese to go with it. Um, as I spotted in the newspaper at the end of November in the Sunday Times, that there is going to be, or that they, they thought there would be a shortage of of Stilton make Stilton available because many Stilton makers reduced the amount of cheese they were making as they weren't um, certain 
what demand there would be this Christmas. Now, I don't necessarily have um, Stilton, and I'm going to, I'll reveal what I prefer later on in our walk, or very shortly, I should say. So let's make our way, continue down Marylebone High Street, and we come to Paul Rothen's son, one of London's oldest delicatessens. You might see it here, it says four generations, and established 1900. And the windows are a real feast um, for the stomach. You can see we have tip tree um, Christmas puddings, tip tree from Essex, it's where loads of jams are made, um, and they do a special Christmas conserve. But the reason I go there is to take um, or to, to enjoy their mince pies. Now, their mince pies, they make, they're homemade, and they make just three dozen of them each day, and they often sell out by lunchtime. My tip, um, as I say, is to get there in the morning, and I enjoy having them. It's a Yorkshire custom, which is where I'm from originally, with crumbly either Cheshire or, Lanc dare I say it, Lancashire cheese. So this is a real feast at Christmas time. I'm sure you've probably got mince pies. Maybe you might be eating one now. But they were brought back to England way back in the 12th century when European crusaders went to the Middle East and they brought back this dish initially filled with meat as well as fruit and spices. And although it's kept the same name, that they're really traditionally now, there isn't any meat in a mince pie. They were first made in an oval shape to represent the manger that J Jesus slept in as a baby with the top representing the top pastry lid representing his swaddling clothes. And during the Stuart and Georgian times, um, you know, in the 17th and 18th centuries, in the UK, mince pies were seen as a status symbol. Way back in 1662, Samuel Pepys, the great diarist, wrote on Christmas Day that he dined by my wife's bedside with great content, having a mess of brave plum porridge and a roasted pullet for dinner, and I sent for a mince pie abroad, my wife not being well enough to make any herself. Now you'll be pleased to know that by the next day she had recovered um, and um, um, he wrote a few years later that on Christmas service he went alone on Christmas Eve, leaving my wife desirous to sleep, having sat up till four this morning watching her maids make mince pies. Um, I, think, I think she had quite a hard time though because he, he expected her to make these mince pies each year. And it wasn't really until the 1861-ish when Mrs. Beaton wrote her book of household management that instructions for a meat-free sweet version um, alongside a meaty version were given. So anyway, as I say, my tip, enjoy some crumbly cheese, not necessarily also always with mince pies, you can have it with fruit cake as well. I have to say, my husband, when he first when he first came to our family home for Christmas, thought this tradition was somewhat bizarre, but he's got used to it now. Let's take a squint now in some wonderful windows um, on Regent Street. So we've cut across to Regent Street and the tradition um, for lights in Regent Street began over 50 years ago, in fact, over 70 years ago in 1954, when local retailers and businesses through the Regent Street Association in range, arranged for a display of lights. And their aim was to show that post-war London didn't have to look drab around Christmas time. And during the 50s and 60s, the installation spread to many other streets. Um, and I suppose normally we'd have the Regent Street lights and the Oxford Street lights, you know, turned on as an event by celebrities. I mean, everyone from, I suppose, Kylie Minogue to um, the Spice Girls, um, and so on, but this year wasn't to be. Um, but the lights are still looking glorious, and the ones in Regent Street are called the Spirit of Christmas. They've returned this year, and there's more than 300,000 lights twinkling above the famous street, which has been a shopping street now for over 200 years, um, named after the Prince Regent, um, who later became George IV, as we all know. So, the first lights traditionally to be turned on each year are those in Oxford Street. So as I said, Regent Street started in 1954. Five years later, we had the first Oxford Street lights. And this year, Oxford Street have done something a little bit unusual. They've got um, 
these kind of light curtains, I suppose would be the best way of describing them. Um, LED lights, 27 of these curtains across the road. Um, and they, they have a little um, poem to London with love. Now, I was a bit confused when I first saw them because can you see here, these lights here, that doesn't look like any word. It looks like Chage Johnson. I, I wondered if it was something to do with Boris Johnson initially. And then I investigated. And what they've done is before the poem starts, the first light curtain has the name of a COVID NHS hero or heroine. And the name changes each week. I believe that they were nominated by various people. So you can, different people have had their, their names up in lights, which I think is really lovely. So what we're going to do, we've got to Oxford Circus. So we're going to make our way all along the Ox, all along Oxford Street to one of London's best known department stores, Selfridges. Right, so let's make our way down. So you can see we've got this love poem to London with love, treasure, and we get to Selfridges and they said, let's change the way we shop. Well, we certainly have this year. I don't know about you. Um, my shopping has not been quite normal. Um, lovely lights outside. And then round the side, we have a whole series of windows with Christmas trees. Um, this is um, the bottom end of Baker Street with the brass rail and Selfridges Christmas stockings. But what they've done is Selfridges have taken the theme of Christmas trees for each of their windows this year. Um, they've had some, I think, some rather more avant-garde windows, shall I say, in the last few years. But the theme this year is how lovely are they, are they branches? And they got various designers to reimagine re a Christmas tree for 2020. And the campaign came off the back of research they undertook, saying, which discovered perhaps not surprisingly, that the three things Brits were most looking forward to this year were shopping for gifts, decorating their Christmas tree and tucking into a, a nice large Christmas dinner. So the store windows filled with different types of Christmas trees. This one garlanded with, it looks like necklaces. Another one with a message of make change now. This one I rather liked with all the parcels and royal mail bags. And a close up here of this particular parcel, as we'll see, kind of addressed to Captain Tom, Hero Way. So I think he's kept us going. And I know John Richardson has been telling us all, and I think you're watching today, John, um, kind of keeping Captain Tom's spirit alive um, each day coming up to Christmas. Rather nice pink one here. Um, the first Christmas tree was lit by the use of electricity back way back in 1882 when there were 80 small electric light bulbs in New York City and this gentleman Edward Johnson also invented the first string of Christmas lights and the first artificial Christmas trees were made from goose feathers and then painted green but as we can see today you can get Christmas trees in any colour including this rather vibrant pink one. I think this is one of our last ones before we go back to Oxford Street. And I couldn't resist just taking a picture. Really, this tells us this is Christmas 2020 with the social distancing sign and, and someone here with their mask on as they walk along the street. But the, me the message is, is good. And I love, you know, with love to London um, and ubiquitous London taxi and the road somewhat clearer than it probably is or probably has been in last year's. So to London, and then we're going to make our way, a little detour down South Moulton Street, pedestrianised with the lights. And the reason I want us to stop here is outside this house. And I want you to look on the first floor where the, the lit windows can be found. And the reason for stopping here is because of the poet, William Blake who lived in London, was born in London, died in London, and for nearly two decades, from 1803 onwards, lived, in this, lived on this first floor of this house. Known for his songs of innocence and experience, also the words to the hymn, Jerusalem. So for, if any of you are WI members, you'll know that, 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 that hymn very, very well. And he lived here with his wife, Catherine. Catherine. And as he, I think just a couple, a year or so before he moved into the house, he wrote a Christmas poem by the cradle side, which includes the verse, 
Sweet babe in thy face, holy image I can trace. Sweet babe, once like thee, thy maker lay and wept for thee, for me. Okay, I think we might be ready for Bond Street. So we're coming down South Moulton Street in the top left-hand corner of the slide and the picture here. We're gonna make our way down New Bond Street before cutting onto Regent Street and then make another detour before popping down Regent Street again. And here on, on um, New Bond Street, um, we've got these wonderful top designer shops and these gorgeous lights, they're, they're legendary peacock feathers. Um, and I think um, I read that there's something like a quarter of a million lights on, on, the, on the lights that we can see down here. And why peacocks? I think they're quite apt. It doesn't seem obvious at first, but I suppose with all these wonderful designer shops, it links back to the late 18th century when young men known as the Bond Street loungers frequented the area in overly ostentatious clothes, um, according to um, their designers. And they were soon, I suppose they were the early fashionist, fashionistas or peacocks of their day. And the endless rows of feathers found along Bond Street are therefore, I think a nice, a lovely nod back to the fashion icons that walked the street in yesteryear, but also now as well. So here we are going past Chanel. And I think it's probably a good stop. Um, I think probably today was the last day we could post our Christmas cards first class and guarantee delivery um, before Christmas Eve or on Christmas Eve. And we stopped outside the post box because Victorian London saw many changes. One of them was the introduction of the penny post um, in 1840, the universal postal system, which meant that for a penny, you could send a letter anywhere in the country for a, a flat rate. So we had the start of the postal system, 1840. And this gentleman, who some of you might recognise, this is a, a, um, a portrait of him made of tiles that you could find or you can find at Victoria and Albert Museum, really his home, because Sir Henry Cole, who was the mastermind or one of the masterminds behind the Great Exhibition of 1851, became the first director of the VNA with after the, um, the surplus monies from the Great Exhibition meant that Albertopolis or the area around South Kensington named after Prince Albert, Queen Victoria's husband, he and Cole worked on the Great Exhibition. And then afterwards, um, Cole became the first director of the Museum of Arts, Crafts and everything um, designer led. And he was involved in the introduction of the Penny Post, but he was also the man behind the very first com commercial Christmas card. And this is it. It's the same year as A Christmas Carol, it's 1843. And he commissioned the artist J.C. Horsley to design a festive season, a festive scene, and had a thousand printed. He didn't have a thousand friends, so the ones he didn't use were then sold off at a shilling each. I mean, I think that's probably quite expensive for a Christmas card. Um, you might notice, um, I'm not sure if this is a Christmas bubble or not. It seemed to be more than half a dozen people. And there's so, certainly not social distancing as far as I can see. Um, but you not only have this family enjoying their Christmas, but to the left and right, you have scenes of Christian charity. So donation of food and clothing for the poor. Um, the other reason that cards, Christmas cards, really became so popular around this time was that printing um, processes had improved somewhat. And over the years, this led to a reduction in the cost of printed cards and the introduction later on of a half penny postage, penny, half penny postage rate. And by the 1880s, it, you know, Christmas cards were a lucrative trade um, industry. And by 1880, 11 and a half million Christmas cards were sent in that year or that period alone. So I love the way that the lights are used on the shops in Bond Street. Um, here we have Tiffany's with its Christmas trees outside and then close by Cartier, the jewellers, wrapped up as a Christmas present itself, the whole shop.
our next detour, we're going to slip back onto from from Regent Street, so, sorry, from Bond Street onto Regent Street. You can see these lovely angels across the road. And we're going to make our detour to a street that was very popular in the 1960s, um, Carnaby Street. Oh, here we have another angel just before we go on to Carnaby Street. And this, as we make our way across, so we've left the lovely angels, here we are on Carnaby Street. Um, as you walk down here, we're immersed in pink neon light from a series of light boxes. Usually Carnaby Street has a, a Christmas event with local shops, bars, restaurants. Last, I think two years ago, they had the lyrics of the Queen's Bohemian Rhapsody across the street. Last year, we had sea creatures, squids and whales in conjunction with Project Zero, an ocean conservation charity. And this year, they have linked with a partnership with a charity, Choose Love, hence Choose Love in Carnaby. Because you, many people can't get there this year, again, you can Google up Carnaby Street or Choose Love in Carnaby Street and take a, 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 an extensive virtual tour online. We're just going to nip in though, just for, to see a few, few of the, the lights. This was a early Saturday evening a few weeks ago. And again, another sign that we're Christmas 2020 with matching purple hand sanitizer stations along the road. Lovely light bulbs and back to Regent Street. And we'll pass from the angels and make a detour southwards through a famous shopping street or shopping arcade. One of, I suppose, London's first shopping shopping precinct or shopping shopping arcade we think of um uh westfield these these days but uh, here we are burlington arcade celebrated its 200th anniversary last year and i always tell people if i'm doing real walks i say look up but it wasn't until i came to take these pictures that i did look up myself i think so often i'm just making my way down into the arcade but if you look up can you see this character on the roof and a close up a little bit further close and indeed some of you who know your statues might recognize this as an Anthony Gormley statue self-portrait and I asked someone how long it had been here I thought perhaps it had just gone up for this Christmas but I was told that it's been there for over two years so it shows I'm not as observant as perhaps I think I am Let's make our way down through the arcade. This year, much quieter than normal. Our beadles, the um, I suppose security men, are still in attendance. Um, they were making sure I was I was behaving myself as I went down, so no whistling, so I wasn't I couldn't warn my any fellow pickpockets, and no umbrellas to be kept open, even though it was raining on the day I walked down. Somewhat quieter during deepest lockdown. But what a sight awaits us when we get to the end onto Piccadilly. Here we have Fortnum and Masons. London's old, old stores. And the front of the building is decked out as an advent calendar. Can you see the numbers on each of the windows? I think they look rather lovely. And with advent calendars, I don't know how many of you have had one this year, but they are, you normally normally count down with a treat every time you open one of the windows. And the festive practice originates from Germany and dates back to the early 19th century. There are two contenders as to uh, who, who produced the very first advent calendars, either the first one in Hamburg in 1902 by a um, a bookshop a bookshop owner. Others claim that the first handmade calendar was made in the late 19th century for a child named Gerhard Lang, whose mother stuck 24 tiny sweets to a square of cardboard for her son to eat over the advent period. And this simple idea stayed with him so that when he was older, he went into partnership with his friend and they opened a printing office. And in 1908, they produced their first printed advent calendar. 
they disappeared. Um, I suppose it became more popular before World War II and made a real return afterwards, particularly in America. And nowadays, I mean, you can get anything in an advent calendar, can't you? I've seen everything from gin to perfume, even cheese, and the really big business. One of the things when you're standing outside Fortnum and Masons, I'm sure many, if not all of you have seen, is this clock above the entranceway. And I just wanted to say, show you because it, 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 it's relevant for the windows we're going to look at now. And um, normally on the hour, Mr. Fortnum and Mr. Mason come out and greet one another. But we're going to look and see what they've done, what Fortnum and Masons have done with their window displays this year. Well, they've got um, mince pies. You've got to have mince pies. They've got Christmas crackers um, and more Christmas crackers here together with the, with the puddings. And this was from last year. They had a crackometer, a bangometer with the Christmas crackers. And I mentioned that because I'm sure you've all got your Christmas crackers ready for Christmas day. These were first made I believe in about 1850 by a London sweet maker of the name of Tom Smith. He'd been to France and he'd seen bonbon sweets, almonds wrapped in pretty paper on a visit to Paris in about 1840. And he came back and he tried selling these sweets um, in England. And he also added, he added um, a motto or riddle inside, but they didn't sell that well. So legend has it that one night he was feeling sorry for himself, sitting in front of his log fire, when he became very interested by the sparks and cracks coming from the logs. Um, and suddenly he thought, what a fun idea would it be if his sweets and toys could be opened with a crack when their fancy wrappers were pulled in half. And that is how our traditional Christmas crackers came about. His son, took over, his sons rather, took over the cracker business after he died, introducing the hats and looking for new ideas. And they had themed crackers, everything, ones for bachelors and spinsters, gifts like false teeth and wedding rings, would you believe it? And they added a joke. Now, I think we all know that Christmas cracker jokes tend to be pretty, um, pretty bad. I couldn't resist this one and it seemed perfect, but really relevant. Um, this was one of the, I think one of the runners up in this year's Christmas cracker competition. So relevant for us today, why couldn't Mary and Joseph join their work conference call because there was no Zoom at the inn? I can hear you all groan, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So let's move on. Tom Smith, here he is with, um, this is their Christmas catalog. I think from about 1911-12, so um, appointment by appointment, you'll see to His Majesty the King and her and the Queen, um, because for years, uh, since um, since they were established, um, certainly Edward Edward the Seventh onwards, they have been the cracker makers for the royal family, and even today they make the Christmas crackers for our royal family. One wonders, um, I suppose we'll think of the Queen and Prince Philip perhaps sitting across each other, across the table at Windsor this year and pulling their very special Christmas crackers. But look at this, this is a catalogue for their, their, I suppose that year's novelties. And that's what Fortnum and Mason have done with their windows. They've gone back and taken catalogues through the years. This is from 1930 and then reproduced them in their windows. Here we have 1934, the curtain is being pulled back by a footman, and this is what they've done with the window this year. 1936, I love these um, gentlemen, the Yeoman Warders. Here they are, smiling and beaming at us. 1957 was the 250th anniversary of the branch, of, 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 the, of the store. So here we have them with their bottle of champagne with Father Christmas. 1965, here we have. Mr. Fortnum and Mr. Mason. Here they are reproduced and with a bit of luck, this little video might work. Let's have a look. I can even hear London buses in the background. They're coming out, they, they've given them, I thought this is lovely, um, Christmas presents and a glass of champagne to toast each other before they make their way 
back inside. There we are. Hoorah, hoorah. And the doors close. And lastly, we've got oh, last couple, 2015, glorious colours, peacock colours. This year, 2020, I think these people are all socially distanced. Here they are on the table. Still having a bit of fun though. Right, let's go on our last lap. We're going past Chocolatier to the Queen. I'm told that she's rather partial to violet, cre violet creams. I have to say I'm more of a quality street person myself. So here's a little box of my quality street for Christmas. Let's make our way down Waterloo Place to see a few Christmas trees. And you know where we are now, I suspect, with the, the lions of Trafalgar Square. Here's great sea captain or sea champion, um, Lord Nelson at the top of his column. And in front of the National Gallery, this is taken just before the tree went up. And then I went down to watch it being erected the first Thursday in November, sorry, in December, I should say. Here it is. And just before the lights are turned on, and here we have it in all its glory. It's the first year we were given this tree for the very first time in 1947 by the Norwegians um, in gratitude for the support we'd given them during the Second World War. And every year since, we've had a tree from Norway. Normally the mayor of Westminster goes out to see it being cut down, not so this year, although I understand the British ambassador in Norway went to see the tree being cut down and it's decorated in Norwegian style with the lights hung vertically. We tend to put them round and round, don't we? But these are vertical, normally a lovely um, service with, the, um, with, with music and the Lord Mayor opening or the mayor opening or turning on the lights this year for the first time since 1947, a virtual representation, um, all done online. And I thought we'd better have a picture of a, a Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. This is taken, I believe, from the Illustrated London News in 1848, where really, I suppose, this, this showed the popularity, the growing popularity of Christmas trees. Um, they were popular in Germany. Queen Victoria, whose mother was German, had, had grown up used to Christmas trees, but I think it's Albert, when they were married, that really insisted that they should make more of the Christmas tree. So this kind of picture made Christmas trees far more popular. And the Queen wrote in her diary, um, she said, Christmas I always look upon as a most dear happy time, also for Albert. Um, who enjoyed it naturally still more in this happy home. It's a pleasure to have this blessed festival associated with one's happiest days. The very smell of the Christmas trees of, gives pleasant memories. To think we already have two children now and one who already enjoys the sight. It seems like a dream. And by the 1860s, hundreds if not thousands of Christmas trees were being sold in Covent Garden Market um, near Trafalgar Square. Well, I wanted to show you just a few other quick pictures of Christmas lights and trees in London before we finished. Um, I popped by on Whitehall to 10 Downing Street just to have a quick look at Boris's tree before going on to Claridge's, rather like these reindeer with the trees adorning the frontage of the hotel. Moving on to Covent Garden, rather oversized baubles and, and bunches of mistletoe and the Christmas tree outside St Paul's, the, the Actors Church in Covent Garden. And this has to be probably the most blingy over the top um, display, or maybe not the most blingy, but I, one of them. This is Annabelle's um, club in Barclay Square with nutcracker music blaring out. Um, so a sight to behold. And last but not least, this is on the banks south side of the River Thames. You might just see in the distance the Tower of London. Here we have um, a reindeer and a, I think this looks like a, 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 a urban, urban um, fox and lovely little red robin. This is on my way to the Bridge Theatre the other, the other week when it, when it was open. But 
let's have a quick look. This is a strand with lights not as busy anywhere as busy as normal because no theatres sadly open. And I'd normally end there, but it just felt a bit of a downer, you know, not many people, um, the lights having not been turned on officially. So I want us to make one final detour. We're pleased to know we can take a number 88 bus. We don't have to walk all the way there. And because of the joy of Zoom, we make an instant um, arrival via Westminster, the Houses of Parliament with their Christmas tree outside. I, was, I did take lots of these pictures from the bus, so it has to be said seem to be a good way to get around. And this number 88 bus takes you down to the back of another art gallery, this time the Tate, the Tate Britain. And if we go around the front by the River Thames, this is the site that you will see. The lights are on until I believe, I think the end of January. They were turned on during another festival, the festival of Diwali in November, the, um, the Hindu ceremony of lights, and they are the work of a young female Liverpudlian artist, Chila Kumari Berman, who specialises in these kaleidoscopic, ultra colourful works. This is an incredible installation commissioned by the Tate. Um, it's a collage of mythology, religion, pop art, feminism, Bollywood, glitter. And you can see this was an early Saturday evening and it was just joyous. It really lifted my spirits. And I hope that's doing the same to you now. Um, we've got, um, I think this is Ganesh, you know, the Hindu elephant god. We've got, the, uh, I think, a tiger. It is glorious. And if you do get a chance, any of you who are near London or in London, if it's allowed or when it's allowed to get down to see it, it really is worth it. And I couldn't, um, I, I couldn't not show you these two great girls. We've got the, the lit up, it looks like an ice cream van here, but just to the right, these two girls were having a bottle of champagne on the steps and I thought, jolly good for you. Um, so if you've got a glass, I'd say raise it now. And I want to wish you all um, a very safe and probably a restful, hope, a restful Christmas, maybe with some family, but if not, have a, have a wonderful time. And I think we'll all be thinking of each other and of better times ahead in 2021 and beyond. <laughs>